Uh, my name is Ken Takamura. I'm a member of the Technology and Performance Architect Group, or TAPA Group, as we, we kind of shortened it to, uh, here at InterSystems. Uh, a little bit of information about me. I, I joined InterSystems as a sales engineer in 2010. Um, last year, I actually moved into the TAPA Group because I wanted to get back working with infrastructure technology because uh, it was an area that I enjoyed working in prior to coming to InterSystems. Um, I previously worked for an HIT vendor that happened to be an InterSystems customer uh, for many years, and I was very fortunate to have been able to have many different hats uh, at that company. So I had pretty wide breadth of experiences from programming to project management to uh, product management and hardware and systems as well. Um, one, of, one of the jobs uh, that I did at the company was to benchmark their application. So I, my, uh, I would be responsible for working with our hardware partners to go out and test our application um, on InterSystems platform and you know, see how far we can scale it up. And, and this, is, this was the testing that we would use to determine uh, what systems we needed to recommend to our customers to accommodate uh, their usage and their load of the application. Um, I spent many, many weeks and months uh, working with uh, the inner systems folks and the hardware vendors you know, on site. Well, this is when you had to actually go onto the site to do hardware testing with the vendor. Uh, and so we would actually be there you know, for, for weeks at a time. Um, but I was always amazed at the rapid pace of uh, hardware technology and how you know, FIST systems improved in performance. Um, and I always kind of wondered, you know, was there ever going to be an end to Murphy's Law? Because it just seems so incredible that, that you had this high rate of increase, doubling of performance basically every 18 months. Um, when I first started testing applications, uh, the early servers that we tested on, uh, let's say something like a, a, a two-socket server, uh, might support somewhere between 25 to 50 concurrent users. Really, you know, nothing uh, compared to today. Uh, and we had to use the old, for some of you that might remember, there was a technology that InterSystems had called MNET that we used to basically scale out to across multiple machines. <coughs> um, in, some, in some of the benchmark tests that I did, uh, we finally were able to, we, we got to a point a few years later where we were actually supporting two to 3,000 concurrent users on commodity dual socket machines. And so coming from 25 to 50 concurrent users to 2,000 to 3,000 was just, just incredible. Um, and this was, the last testing I did with that company was, was approaching probably, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. And so today, I, I imagine that if we were to run the same tests again, that on current technology, we probably could support 20 to 30,000 concurrent users on a commodity dual socket. So pretty amazing. Um, oh, sorry. I went too far here. So a little bit of information about the TAPA group. Uh, we are responsible for benchmark testing with our technology. We work with um, all the InterSystems products, including HealthShare, TrackCare, and uh, we are actually <coughs> doing some testing with uh, the InterSystems Iris data platform. We also work with our application partners and customers to test applications. Uh, we're also responsible for developing architectural standards, recommendations, and best practices for infrastructure and sysops. So we get to work with many vendor partners encompassing everything from server, storage, networking, virtualization, and of course even cloud nowadays. That's a big topic uh, for many of you. Um, we, so we go out and do t benchmark testing with these vendors. Uh, we develop sizing and configuration recommendations. And we also occasionally get involved when a customer is experiencing performance issues. So we'll go in and do some analysis, try to identify the issues, and, and make some recommendations to correct it. Um, a little, about our team, we're, we're actually quite global. 
Uh, my other team members are located, we have two in Australia, uh, one in the UK, um, and our manager is actually between Texas and Boston. So he kind of splits his time there. I actually live here in Southern California in Orange County, so I'm just a couple of hours drive away from here. Okay, so this session, um, sizing capacity is to talk about how to avoid bottlenecks caused by increased buck growth before they become a problem. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna discuss metrics at the operating system, at the inner systems platform layer, as well as your application uh, uh, layer as well. So things you should look at, how to interpret them, and then I'll describe the process of what we do to size a um, you know, cache or inner systems platform environment uh, with, uh, with for our health share and track care applications as examples. Uh, I also wanted to give credit to uh, one of my team members, Murray Oldfield, because he actually did this presentation last year. So a lot of this material is actually, or most of this material is actually um, stuff that he's created. Okay, so where do we start? Uh, one of the things you, you really have to do is, is in order to do planning, you need to do monitoring and measurement of your systems today. So we'll look at some of the key metrics um, uh, and how to use this information for monitoring growth and proactively planning for capacity. Okay, the, the idea here of relating hardware to food groups is that you want the groups to be in balance. Um, you might think of that having too much of any one of these, too much memory or too much processor, too much storage, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, and that's true, but it also means that you could be wasting resources that, that are basically being unused. So key operating system metrics, and we separated them here out by CPU, memory, and I.O. So at the um, operating system layer, you might want to look at things like CPU utilization, uh, your run queues, uh, and memory, you look at how much is free and how much you're paging. Um, and for I.O., service time and queues. <clears throat> then at uh, the, the intersystems platform, lay platform layer, there are some metrics that will provide you with some, some key information about what's going on with um, uh, cache or one of the intersystems platforms. So you look at, for CPU, you look at things like routine metrics and for memory, you might want to look at efficiency. Efficiency is really a measure of uh, how often you um, uh, are able to reference data that exists in your global buffer pool, which sits in your shared memory segment, as opposed to having to go out to physical good disk to get that data. Obviously, if you're, getting, if you're able to get that data from memory, it's going to be much faster and perform better than if you have to go to physical disk. And then, of course, you, you, know, you do have to go to physical disk reads and writes, and so you want to be able to see you know, what kind of service times and queues there are. Um, another important measurement or, or uh, data point is global references, or you might hear us refer to it as glow refs, uh, global references per second. So what that is is um, how many times we're making reference to uh, data in the database global or in a global, uh, and if you're using object script, for example, this is mostly um, caused by when you do sets or kill commands. Uh, so uh, this, this is a good measure of how much general activity is going on on the system. And I know uh, many, many partners and customers really use this as the key measurement for, de for uh, determining sizing and performance characteristics for new platforms. Yeah. Are those uh, just for that specific period of time, time slice, or are they cumulative? Well, global references it will, will report a rate of uh, how many per second generally. So you want, you want to look at that, but you want to capture that information over periods of time because what you want to be able to look for is, you know, what happens throughout the day? When are your peak times? Because you're going to have to size for your 
your peak usage. You can't really average it out and say, you know, I just need this for the average because when you hit those peak times, and, and for many, many enterprises, that's, you know, first thing Monday morning. Uh, and for a lot of applications, it also means uh, at, you know, just after midnight to accommodate daily processing or batch processing and reporting. Okay, and then on top of that, you, you need to determine application metrics. And, and you can measure application performance in, in a lot of different ways. It doesn't necessarily mean things that come from the system. You know, one metric might even be is, you know, what's the rate of your phone reeking from your end users and complaining about the performance? You know, maybe if you're getting one a day, that's really not a big deal. If you're getting 100 a day, that indicates that there's probably a problem. Um, Another way possibly to measure your, your application <clears throat> metrics is through a transaction rate of some kind. It could be something like, uh, you know, the number of episodes in a day or, you know, how many you're actually processing in an hour, encounters, tests, uh, inquiries. Um, for those of you that are using Ensemble um, or HealthShare, maybe even your messaging rate, that actually is a pretty important metric uh, for those applications. Um, another one could be the, the number of concurrent users because obviously the more concurrent users you have on the system, the more load that there's generally going to be. We often find when we get involved with customers that are, are having performance problems that they are actually the uh, result of issues within the application, possibly configuration settings uh, or something else rather than uh, system capacity or operating system configuration or cache configuration. <clears throat> uh, an example could be that, uh, let's say, uh, maybe a user writes some type of ad hoc query that runs against the entire database uh, and doesn't utilize indexes. And so it's basically thrashing through all the data. It's causing the, the global buffers to be flushed out and, and brought in with new data which is gonna affect the performance of other processes because the, the data that they might normally have in, the, in memory in global buffer, in the global buffer pool has now been flushed down. They actually have to go to physical disk now, uh, which is far more slower. And then it, it just kind of builds into this cumulative effect that results in, in poorer performance. Um, if you have any performance issues, um, you should feel free to to open a case with the WRC because they, we actually have a team on the WRC that specializes in analyzing performance issues. Um, they're very good at what they do and, and they, they will help you identify the issues, whether they're in cache or in your application. Yes? Yes, okay, so I, I, uptime is very important because you want your, your systems to be, be nonstop. I didn't really uh, include that information here because I think, I think maybe that's better suited for uh, you know, discussion about availability and some of the, the technologies that we use. Um, for example, uh, our cache mirroring, database mirroring is something that I think you know, if you're, you're interested in high availability, that is something you should consider using. Um, other, other people are using um, operating system-based clustering, you know, whether it's Veritas or IBM HA or so on. Um, we actually have a very good white paper up on our website that talks about high availability strategies and uh, compares uh, mirroring, cache mirroring to operating system clustering and even even hybrid strategies where uh, using both cache database mirroring along with, uh, say, something like VMware HA, uh, if you're using VMware virtualization, can give you kind of the best of both worlds. The, the, uh, you get benefits of the strengths of both of those technologies to, to work together. So uh, if, if you're interested in that and, and uptime, I, I would encourage you to look at that white paper. Okay, collecting metrics. Uh, there's a, there are a number of ways to collect metrics. The information that they provide can be useful in different ways. Uh, and it's 
to be useful, it's important that you should be collecting these metrics regularly and understand and establish baseline performance characteristics. You have to really kind of get an idea of, of what's normal for your system, uh, what may be an anomaly, and, you know, so that you can identify when maybe some things um, not so good are happening on your system as opposed to regular growth. Uh, if you do this, you, know, you may see over time that Yes, the, the utilization CPU load may be increasing over time. Your storage usage will be increasing and so on. <coughs> um, let's see. So listed up here are, are a bunch of different tools. I won't talk about each one of them individually, but uh, these are all things you can use to, to collect data about how your system is performing. A little bit of information on a couple of utilities that we have. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Carrot block collection, or uh, BLKCOL, will take a time sample and show what we call block collisions. Block collisions are more, when more, one, more than one process uh, is attempting to access a, a data block. And if it's not able to access the block because another process is accessing it, then it has to wait, basically, until it becomes available. So that's a collision. Uh, if you get a lot of collisions, it basically means you have contention, and, and that affects the performance of the system. Some of this is normal, but if you get a lot of them on a particular block, it might be something you could look at more specifically to see if there's something you could do to alleviate the block collisions. So in this case, uh, this this particular example shows uh, in a 10 second sample that there were 655 block collisions. And I don't know if you can see it's a little bit small, but um, out of those, block 129 had 58 con uh, collisions, which is significantly more than the other blocks that are shown. So it could be worthwhile to examine the data in this block to figure out why it's had more collisions than others, because it, it, it could eventually uh, result in a bottleneck in your system. <clears throat> I'm sorry, what I didn't quite hear. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Uh, do care glow buff. This is, uh, it will provide you with a list of globals that are in the global buffer pool, and it sorts them by the percentage of the pool that it's actually using. In this case, global PAADM accounts for over 36% of the global buffers in use. But if you notice, buffers in use is lower than the total number of buffers <coughs> in the instance. So this system doesn't appear to be suffering from low uh, efficiency, uh, which is the ratio of logical references to physical reference. So I wouldn't be too concerned about performance here. Now, if you look at this information the next day and you see something like a global maybe called carrot report taking up 90% of the buffers in use and, and all the buffers are in use, that could be a clue that there's a process, likely a report, that's just turning through the data and, and having a negative impact on all the processes on the system. <coughs> Okay, P-buttons, how many of you are familiar with P-buttons? Okay, probably most of you here. So this is, this is the kind of, this is the go-to tool that we use for uh, getting performance data. Uh, it will collect data about a cache instance and also on the platform on which it is running. And the WRC, as well as our group, can use this data to help diagnose system issues. Um, if you've ever opened up a support case uh, for a performance issue, uh, almost certainly the first thing they'll ask you to do, if you haven't already done it, is to run a P-buttons collection to get the data. A uh, couple, of, couple of things to know about P-buttons. It's actually customizable so that you can add your own code to P-buttons to collect application metrics. So the things we talked about before, like capturing maybe um, number of messages, a message rate, or uh, 
number of, of patient records or things like that. You can actually code that in and add it to B buttons so that you can gather that data and then correlate it to the other data that's being collected. Uh, organizations often don't run P buttons until after there's a performance problem. Uh, what, what we would recommend doing, though, is that you set up, set up a task that runs P buttons out of the task manager, uh, basically collecting 7 by 24, maybe, uh, you know, at some, some interval. But if you're collecting that data, if you have a performance event, we'll have some data to, to review and look at with you, rather than if it's after the fact, we'll, we'll basically not really have any information to go back and try to figure out what happened. We might be able to see if we start collecting P-Buttons data from that point if it happens again, but that doesn't always happen that way. So it, one thing to th consider is to, to be collecting P-Buttons all the time. <clears throat> So in order to run peatments, there's essentially two steps. There's a, uh, where you run the collection, or, or run the, the P buttons run, and then you do a collection, which basically gathers all the, the data that's collected and, and outputs it in a, an HTML, HTML file. Okay, and the, and the HTML file is actually readable, uh, human readable, but there's so much data in it that, that it's really difficult to make any sense out of it or to figure out what's happening with the system. So here in this, in this picture, um, you see on the, the top of the screen, that's just, just beginning of the P buttons report. And these are all, if you click on any of them, they'll take you to the section of that, that page that has that data. Now, you can, you can extract the data from the report. Uh, the WRC has a number of tools to do this. Uh, but if you are familiar with the developer community, develop, uh, community.intersystems.com, there's actually several posts on there that give great information, uh, as well as tools that you can download from GitHub uh, on how to extract the data from this report and to graph it as well. There, there are actually tools provided for graphing. <clears throat> so one of the things that the extraction does is, is it might generate something like a, a CSV. So that's an example of a spreadsheet that has the CSV data that's been extracted out of the P buttons report. And then further taking that and then graphing that data like on the graph on the right bottom there. Okay, some, some examples of, of running, you know, different things or, or doing different things with P buttons. Um, one of the first things that you might want to do when you, you start working with P buttons is uh, designate a space or directory for the output to go to rather than your, ma otherwise it's going to end up in your manager's directory and may end up filling it up because the output is actually quite large. So the first, first command line there, oops, Sorry. First command line there is the you know command to actually designate uh, an alternate directory for put, uh, for the output files. The second one here is how you can define a profile. And while these are all command line uh, examples, you can actually do it through the P buttons utility and and set it up through um, a Chewy interface. <clears throat> so this is setting up a profile where you're going to run it. Um, for, for 24 hours at 30 second intervals, uh, and the, this, these are the commands. You can also run it in direct mode manually using the P buttons utility. And then you can also run it, uh, here's an example of setting it up in the task manager to run automatically every day. Okay, so once you, once you get the data, you're, you know, you're going to want to graph uh, the metrics uh, because they're, they're helpful in that they can provide correlation of, of performance data over time. So the graph on the left shows the correlation of, of, on a system of CPU time and, and, app, and within the application, the transactions per, the transaction rate. So transactions per minute. And so as you know, would probably seem obvious is that the more transaction 
the higher transaction rate you have, the more CPU load or usage there's going to be. Um, now the graph on the right, this one's just totally made up, but it, it's, it's just to correlate usage. It, it, it's showing you know, correlation of usage of uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer and the murder rate. So as the, as the usage you know, across you know, with Microsoft Explorer goes down, the murder rate goes down as well. <laughs> Again, not, not, a, not a real true life thing, just a, just a made up example. Okay, so here's, here's a graph that was generated from some P buttons data. Um, this happens to be a, a site that is running ECP and it's a measurement of remote global references. So global references across ECP. And this is over a 24 hour period of time. Um, if you notice, you'll see kind of two peak areas, and the time uh, correlates to peak times in the morning and peak times in the afternoon. And there's a little bit of a drop off around little after noon, the lunchtime hour. So users are going to lunch. There's a little bit less activity on the system. Then when they come back, they start doing work again, and it gets a little more busy. This is this is actually a line graph generated from data that was collected through P buttons. Now, this one is a little bit different. It's actually the same data, but put on a, a scatter plot. Uh, so we're actually just putting a dot for the points rather than generating lines for each measurement. Um, and it so shows a little bit of a different uh, pattern than you see maybe with, with the line chart. If I look at the line chart, I actually tend to think that, that you know, we really have a uh, uh, pretty high rate of you know global references you know maybe maybe peaking normally around eighty thousand but if I look at this one I actually see that um, you know things above sixty thousand tend to be more of outliers than to be a consistent pattern so uh, you know I, I kind of see in this case that that the the usage that the peak usage actually may be a little bit less than the line graph implies. There's also some interesting stuff going on with the, with the density of the uh, uh, plots or the, the points at various levels here. And I actually have to, I was going to ask uh, the person who generated the graphs uh, what was going on there, because it is kind of interesting. Uh, Matt, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, this, this particular one, I don't, there's not a lot of, um, you know, other information here. I don't know, quite know the, you know, what the, what the higher percentage is that's shown on the CPU utilization here. Um, what you, what you want to look for is, is in using the information, you want to kind of establish or learn, you know, what the normal condition of your system is. And if you graph this out over a longer period of time, you know, maybe weeks or months, and you start to look at you know, what's, what's happening with the system, you'll probably see uh, you know, most enterprises are growing in some way. Um, you'll see a trend, a you know, slight upward trend. Uh, and you want to be able to recognize at what point you know, is this going to become a problem. If you're running already at 90 percent uh, CPU utilization much of the time, I would say you know, you're, you're probably you need to either find out if there's a problem or if, you're, if that's actually what you need, you know, you're probably due for adding processors uh, or increasing the system capacity in some way. Um, it, it really kind of, kind of depends. Um, you know, if you're, I, I guess at 90%, that's, that's pretty high, and I'd be worried about running there for any extended length of time because it doesn't take much for something to happen that's going to push 
push it over the edge and then affect everybody's performance and you generally don't want that to happen. So again, you know, you, what? Oh, okay, so, so um, we tend to use, and, and some of the customers that I've worked with uh, will use 70 to 80 percent maybe as the, the threshold that they want to max out at. Um, and that's, that's kind of a general rule. It, it really, if you have a, an application that tends to be, be very peaky and you need to support um, uh, loads that, that are you know, very high for short periods of time, that might, that might mean you have to do something a little bit different. But uh, if you have the data, you have, you know, information, you can graph this. Uh, visualizing it is just a very good way to get an idea, you know, of how your, your capacity is and, you know, when you might start running into problems. Any other questions on, on this? Okay. Okay, so, oh, okay, CPU considerations. Um, as I mentioned with, with Murphy's Law, uh, s performance of systems will, within, say, like a two to three year period of time will be, you know, two to four times better. Um, this chart shows an, um, information about uh, standard spec benchmarks uh, that are testing different servers with different processors. And uh, on the right-hand column, you see the baseline result. And this is just a relative value of, of the performance that the benchmark achieved on these various platforms. And so if you compare the first one, uh, which is uh, a um, hardware platform that was available since December 2011, to the third one, the Dell R730, which is something that came out uh, about three years later, the, the performance measured under this standard benchmark was about two and a half times the former. Um, so one thing to think about, uh, we get c questions from customers sometimes, should I buy a very large server that leaves me a lot of room for growth? And unless you need that growth relatively quickly, say within a three-year period of time, it generally doesn't make sense to buy it because you're going to pay premium, uh, a premium price for the higher-end technology. Uh, and you may never ever get to a point where you actually need to utilize it all. And within two to three years' time, there's going to be new server technology, new processors that are going to get far better uh, performance, far better um, you know, price performance ratio, uh, and so you'll actually end up spending less money than if you bought a big server with growth available for, you know, for a long time, as opposed to maybe replacing or refreshing your server technology in, within a shorter period of time. Um, if you're on a cycle of replacing hardware from, you know, I, there are customers I've worked with that, that are really like on seven to ten year cycles, that's really a long time, maybe too long. Um, I, think, I think generally you probably want it to be about three years. Okay, some considerations. Um, when you're dealing with memory, uh, the amount of memory is not really the only factor that you want to look at. Uh, you need to consider you know, the size, speed, and, and the number of memory channels. If your system accepts multiple memory modules, you want them to be balanced uh, by using modules of the same size, speed, and, and distribute them evenly across all available channels. Uh, one of the rules of thumb that we're currently using when determining the amount of memory is that we, we, we do sizing and we calculate, you know, what are the processor requirements? How many, how many processors or how many cores or how many vCPUs do we need to configure to support a particular load? And then, based on that, uh, we recommend eight gigabytes of memory per processor core. And, and further, we would recommend that you take 60% of that and configure that as your global buffer pool. Okay, and this, this is kind of a general recommendation. Of course, it could be different for different applications. So, so you really need to kind of do testing and verification 
uh, with your app to determine what the best usage is. Storage considerations. Um, the the co most common problem that we hear about is when customers have, don't have enough storage space, they're running out of space, their database growth was you know, much more than they expected, uh, they don't have enough disk space, they, they can't buy new disk, um, and that's really kind of the, the most common uh, problem that we see happening. Uh, IOPS, or you know, uh, IO per second, isn't the most common problem, but it's an important measure uh, for performance. Um, what you want to just make sure is that your, your storage needs to be configured to meet also your availability requirements as well as I.O. patterns. Every application could have different I.O. patterns, so um, you, may, you may need to understand that to be able to um, uh, correctly you know, monitor and fix performance issues related to storage. Okay, on this slide, um, I, I, I don't want to go into the details of the graph, but the idea here is that uh, spinning disks is a technology that's going away. Um, if you're still buying it, you should really be looking at uh, going to you know, flash storage technology, SSDs. Um, the, the reliability and cost has has come down significantly, so, so it makes it reasonable to, to use SSD storage. Uh, one of the trends that we are, are moving toward and, and starting to recommend to our customers is not only with uh, using SSDs as storage, uh, we're also recommending the, the faster uh, NVMe or, or non-volatile memory uh, express as the caching tier for storage and then using SSD as your, your storage tier. And you don't necessarily need to even tier it. You could potentially even make your um, entire storage based on NVMe. The, the performance of, of NVMe and SSD is just so far superior to spinning disks that it really doesn't make sense to try to, to you know, utilize spinning disks at this point. Um, one, one note that I want to mention, um, uh, a lot of you are, are working with different vendors and exploring newer technologies. One of the um, popular or, or uh, storage technologies that has gained a lot of attention recently is VMware's vSAN storage. Um, I just want to let you know that, that if you're considering VMware vSAN storage, uh, for, your, for your data, please come and talk to us first because we, we actually have run into some issues and uh, if you're considering, we wanna make sure that you're aware of some of these things uh, before you actually go into that direction. Okay, we're, we're running, getting close to time, but uh, we're almost done here. So, uh, just to give you an idea of what we do when we're sizing health share and track care, it's, it's a process that we, we go through. It's, it's relatively straightforward, but, but over time we've captured you know, the metrics with our applications across many customers and different configurations. And using this information, we've developed algorithms um, using this customer information and, and their configure information as well. So we, this is all plugged into a spreadsheet with the, the algorithm. So the spreadsheet, when we're sizing a new customer, an existing customer that wants to uh, upgrade their systems, uh, we plug in you know, metrics about what they, how they will be using the system, like they might give us their messaging rate, uh, they might give us the number of patient records, and the uh, number of encounters per year, things like that. We plug them into the spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet will calculate um, CPU, you know, how much CPU do they actually need, and this is across different kinds of platforms, including um, uh, AIX, uh, Linux, as well as, um, uh, I, what do we, have? we have some other ones in there too, but it'll, it'll calculate for each platform, the, the different CPU requirements, storage, um, and memory that we would recommend for 
based on the, the data that was plugged into it. Um, we, we also provide detailed configuration information. So when we plug this information in and it comes up with, you know, what, what's the total amount of disk space, we also will um, list out the, the actual, you know, names and, and you know, the amount of space needed for each database and, and all the namespaces that'll be needed. So it, it's really, it can really be used as a configuration uh, guide when, when they're setting up the system. For most systems, we, we use something that we refer to as t-shirt sizing. So we have groups of configurations that are lumped into small, medium, large, and extra large. So uh, for each size, we have um, already prepared detailed reference configurations. So uh, what this allows us to do is that when, when a customer comes to us and, and wants us to size uh, their system requirements, uh, they give us their information, we, we plug it in, and we kind of figure out where in the small, medium, large, extra large uh, that they would fit. And then we can, you know, immediately, if they fit within the large, we can basically pull off a prepared uh, detailed configuration sheet and provide it to them. So this, this allows us to respond much more quickly to sizing requests rather than having to build custom ones for each, each request. Uh, however, you know, really large systems will still require custom configuration work. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of it. We're actually just about out of time here. I wanted to point out some resources that if you're, if you're interested in, in learning more, um, there's, there are some talks at the Tech Exchange that cover performance and performance monitoring as well as uh, some of the benchmarking, um, benchmark tests that we've done. There are other sessions you might want to go to. There's, there's actually an application performance management session tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Um, there is also a session on hyperconverged infrastructure uh, in Desert Salon 1314, just following this one. So that's actually one of the areas that uh, the TAPA group is working with and investigating and doing testing on. Because uh, I, I imagine that many of you are probably very interested in um, you know, hyper-converged infrastructure as well as uh, maybe, maybe hybrid cloud um, technology and, and migration to you know, cloud services in general. The Global Summit Resource Guide uh, is at you know, intersystems.com slash GS2017 Learning Resources. So all the, the, the uh, presentations and the recordings will be posted there. Uh, by the way, if you, if you downloaded a copy of the presentation for this session, it's actually changed since it was posted on the website. So I'll be uploading the, uh, an updated copy by tomorrow sometime. Uh, developer community. Developer community is actually a very good resource for getting information, um, including uh, sizing, performance monitoring. There's actually, uh, Mur I don't know if Murray's here, but there's actually some very good articles that he and uh, uh, Fabian Haupt have written uh, describing and, and instructing on how to use tools that they've created to, to do the extract and graphing. And the code that they've, they've written to support this is actually all available on GitHub. So it's readily available for you to download and use. The other thing that you might, whoops, sorry, you might be want to check out is we have a data platform blog at the, the address, the, the URL on the screen. Uh, take a look at that because there might be relevant information that you might want to keep tabs on uh, uh, for the future. And then if you would like more information or if you want to discuss any, anything that we've talked about here today, uh, you can contact me at my email address, or you can try to contact me by messaging me on the app. Okay, with that, uh, thank you for attending. Um, please complete the, the conference service, and if, if anybody has any questions, I know we're, we're pretty much out of time, but I'd be happy to you know, chat with you if you want up here, and, or we can take it uh, to another room. Thank you. <clears throat>